afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final talk today in our Advanced Therapies panel series. Today, we will have Dr. Anish Kanango and David Giesbrecht here to speak for us on apomorphine. My name is Alana Dillon. I'm an Education and Support Services Coordinator at Parkinson Society BC, and I'll be facilitating our webinar today. Uh, before I introduce our panel speakers today, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items with you. Uh, first, I do want to let you know that we are recording this webinar and the presentation slides will be available on our website to view. If you are not comfortable being seen on video in the recording, please keep your video camera switched off and only use the chat box to type questions. The video camera is the second icon from the far left on the bottom bar if you are on a computer. A line through the icon indicates it is off. And your mics are also muted to prevent any noise interference or feedback in the webinar during the talk. So please only unmute yourself during the question and answer period, and then mute yourself once the question is asked. And the mic icon is the first icon on the bottom bar on the far left, and a line through it indicates it is muted. Um, you may also use the chat box on the right-hand side to type questions if you choose. Um, it is an interactive webinar, so we do encourage questions. And you will also see the chat box at the right-hand side of your screen, as I just mentioned, but sometimes it is um, not expanded and you'll see a chat icon at the very bottom of the bar. If you click on that, it will expand the chat box. Um, we will be um, having a question and answer period after the talks and you're free to type your questions in the chat box during the webinar for either David or Dr. Kanungo. And finally, to optimize your experience with this webinar, please ensure that you adjust your speaker volume both on your computer as well as on your actual speaker so that you can hear the webinar well. I'd now like to introduce our panel speakers, Dr. Kanungo and David Giesbrecht. Dr. Kanungo attained his PhD in molecular biology from the University of Toronto for his work in decoding the molecular pathways which govern neuronal programmed cell death. He then moved west to attend medical school at the University of Calgary, after which he completed his neurology residency training at the University of Manitoba. This was followed by a fellowship in movement disorders at the University of Manitoba, funded by Parkinson's Canada. He is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine, University of British Columbia, and one of the three neurologists practicing in the Fraser Health Movement Disorders Clinic. He actively participates in the training of medical students and residents and maintains an interest in research aimed at improving the lives of people with movement disorders. And following Dr. Kanungo, we have David Giesbrecht, who is the care partner of Betty Giesbrecht. Uh, he is kindly sharing the story of Betty receiving apomorphine and the impact it's had on their lives living with Parkinson's. Dr. Kanungo, and David, welcome and thank you for being here today to speak for us on this panel. Um, I will pass it over to you now, Dr. Kanungo, to start off the panel talks. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anish Kanungo. I'm one of the movement disorder neurologists at Fraser Health Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, thanks for having me again. Um, and so let me just uh, uh, start by saying that we're going to discuss a little bit about our about what apomorphine is today, um, how it's used in people with Parkinson's disease, um, and um, a little bit of the background of how it works uh, to help improve the motor symptoms that people with Parkinson's have. Um, I'm just going to switch the screen over now so that you can see my slides. All right, can you guys see all my slides there, Lana? Yep, all good. Okay, so um, we're again going to discuss this medication here, apomorphine. Before I start, I have some dis disclosures and acknowledgements. Uh, I've served as a consultant on the advisory boards for Synovian Pharmaceuticals and Paladin Labs. Uh, for which I've received compensation for my involvement. These are the companies that market Kinmobi and Movopo, respectively. Um, I'm not a patent holder, shareholder, or financially invested in any of the pharmaceutical products 
being discussed in this presentation, and I'm not receiving any financial support in the form of research grants from any industry or commercial supporters. So again, outline of today's talk, uh, we're going to have a general discussion of how Parkinson's medications work and why they stop working adequately uh, and result in what we discuss as motor fluctuations as a prelude to understanding why and how apomorphine works in the treatment of people with Parkinson's disease. Um, I'll then introduce you to apomorphine. We'll discuss how it works and its pros and cons. Um, and then we'll discuss how either Kinmobi, which is a sublingual apomorphine, and Movapo, which is a subcutaneous apomorphine, how they're actually practically used. Um, so starting with a little bit of background into how levodopa actually works. So levodopa is the chemical building block of dopamine. Uh, this is how it typically looks. If you're taking the immediate release formulation, it's usually a yellow tablet scored down the middle. When you take this medication, it gets absorbed in the small intestine, gets into the bloodstream, advances up into the brain where there is an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase that will convert this building block into dopamine. Um, it's affected by a number of different things um, in terms of absorption, which is typically discussed as being between about 30 to 90 minutes before the medication starts working. So uh, many people know that protein uh, taken together with the levodopa pills will reduce its absorption, but so will changes in gastric motility. So if you have diarrhea or constipation, both of those things can reduce the absorption of the medication and hence how well it works. Um, carbonated beverages are well known to help it improve the absorption speed as are things like orange juice and crushing the tablets. Together with the levodopa, we give a secondary medication that is uh, built into the drug called carbidopa. Carbidopa is a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. This medication cannot advance into the brain compartment. So when we give the levodopa, what we're trying to do with the additional component here is prevent some of the levodopa from being converted to dopamine in the bloodstream. This helps to do a couple of things. One, it helps to reduce the systemic side effects uh, of conversion of levodopa to dopamine in the bloodstream. And two, it can also increase the amount of levodopa that is transported to the brain and helps to secondarily improve its action by about one and a half hours. When people start to notice difficulties with their medications, we start to call these motor fluctuations. What essentially happens is shown here on the red line. We give medication in a pulsatile way several times a day, usually at the start about three times a day. Now, this is not how the brain normally produces levodopa. The brain usually produces levodopa in a more constant fashion. This can result in some problems. One problem, when the levodopa levels and the dopamine levels in the brain are too low, people can experience what is known as wearing off, which we'll discuss a little bit more in detail in a few slides. And if the dopamine levels in the brain are too high, then we can get the phenomenon of dyskinesia, where people start to wiggle and move and writhe in an involuntary way. In other words, they're a bit toxic on the amount of levodopa and dopamine that is inside the brain at that moment. The green line here shows what physiologic release of dopamine by the brain looks like. It is much smoother, it is more constant. And this is what we would like to try to do ultimately with our medication, is to provide medication in this nice smooth way that keeps it within this therapeutic window, not too low and not too high. In the early stages of Parkinson's disease, a low dose of levodopa typically tops up the dopamine levels in the brain such that people get very consistent control of their motor symptoms with just three doses a day. But as the disease progresses, you lose more of the dopamine producing brain cells and you also lose some of the brain cells that respond and store dopamine in the brain. And this is what makes it harder for each dose of levodopa to prevent symptoms from reemerging. And this is what 
uh, is experienced by people with Parkinson's as wearing off, where the medications simply don't make it all the way to the next dose before the effect diminishes. And during periods of wearing off, people can experience a whole host of different uh, symptoms, including a return of slowness, stiffness, resting tremor, which are the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, um, and other non-motor symptoms as well, such as feelings of anxiety, shortness of breath, uh, even pain that can happen between the doses of levodopa if they wear off prematurely before the next dose can be given. There are many different types of off episodes. Um, and so we classify them with very specific names. The first is the one that's most commonly experienced, which is just wearing off uh, between doses of levodopa. This may be occurring between every dose or only following certain doses taken during the day. Some people will experience what's known as a morning off. This is when a person awakens in the morning in an off state prior to taking their first dose of levodopa. As many will recognize, the last dose of the day and the first dose the next morning has the longest gap in the 24 hour period. And so the medications can wear off overnight, leaving the person in an off state when they wake up the next morning. There are so-called late afternoon wearing off episodes where people wear off during a specific part of the day, very often during the late afternoon. There are what is known as delayed ons, where you've just taken your medication, but it takes too long for the medication to kick in. And so you're sitting there waiting for the medication to start working. There are also even partial or failed ons, where you take a medication and it fails to give you the typical robust effect that you would normally experience with every other dose of levodopa. And there can be unpredictable offs, which can occur in a random fashion where the levodopa medication suddenly turns off long before it's supposed to be taken again. The impact of off episodes has been looked at by multiple different research groups. Um, in general, the off episodes lead to reduced quality of life uh, as people will experience problems with mobility during their off episodes, such as having more difficulty getting up, getting to the bathroom, being active in the morning, or being able to maintain an active lifestyle because they're not certain if their medications will wear off when they leave the house. Reemergence of tremor during the off episodes can affect dexterity and people can have sudden problems with uh, taking their meals, performing house chores, or even work tasks. People can get pain from rigidity. Increased rigidity during the off episodes can lead to difficulty rolling in bed or the phenomenon known as frozen shoulder. And it can also be experienced in another way where there is overactivation of muscles in the lower part of the leg resulting in what we call dystonia, which is a medical term for twisting. And this very typically results in twisting of the feet or curling of the toes. And people can even experience problems with anxiety and depression during the off episodes because they're waiting for their medication to wear off and they're worried about whether the medication will wear off and how that might impact their day. We've known for a long time that off episodes increase the number of ER visits, hospitalizations, and ICU admissions even that pa patients with Parkinson's disease will experience. And of course, this ends up translating into higher rates of nursing home placement and higher economic burden on healthcare systems if off episodes are not well managed in patients. Uh, a recent online survey of 3,000 people with Parkinson's disease uh, by the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, concluded that 64% pe uh, of people with Parkinson's disease will experience between two to four hours of off time during a typical day. There are various strategies that we can do to reduce or alleviate the off time that people with Parkinson's experience. One is simply to increase the dose of levodopa that the person is taking. But as we showed in the graph that I showed earlier, 
the dose can get too high and this can lead to toxicity where people get problems with excessive body movement, aka dyskinesia, or other side effects that can be associated with too much levodopa. Um, decreasing the time between doses of levodopa is another strategy that is often employed. But again, this can lead to more side effects. And of course, it leads to greater inconvenience. Um, we all know that the medication has to be spaced a little bit apart from protein containing meals so that you absorb all of the levodopa in the pill. And if we get the times to a certain uh, interval where it's too frequent, like say every two hours, and it can be difficult to plan when are you going to have your protein containing meal. Um, another strategy that has been used for a long time to help improve or reduce uh, wearing off episodes is to increase the amount of time that levodopa is active in the brain by inhibiting its breakdown. There are two enzymes that are involved in the breakdown of levodopa. The first one is COMT and the second one is MAOB. And there are various medications that are used to target each of these breakdown pathways. And uh, more and more as we move into the future for treatments with Parkinson's disease, we're aiming to get more consistent or continuous delivery of dopamine stimulating medication so that it never gets too low and it never gets too high. Um, one such approach is the new pro patch. The advantage of a transdermal system is that medication that's absorbed through the skin gets absorbed at a very constant rate. Another uh, example is extended release formulations of levodopa. There are several that have come to the market in the US, including Vitari. Presently, these are not covered by Pharmacare uh, in BC and not approved by the, uh, the national body Cadeth to be used. Um, in discussion with some colleagues, uh, these medications have their pros and cons. Um, the other thing that you guys had heard about from Dr. Weil was intestinal levodopa gel via duodopa pumps. And that is something that we finally gotten approval from Pharmacare to do uh, in an unrestricted way for patients with Parkinson's, whereas previously it was restricted to just five patients per year. And this last one is probably something that we're going to use much more frequently moving forward. So adjunctive therapies are used to reduce the overall off time but some people with Parkinson's will still continue to experience off episodes, no matter how aggressive we are with the regular therapies that they're taking. So another strategy to help reduce off time are on-demand therapies with rapid onset. And this is where we get into discussing apomorphine. One such therapy that I put in, in grayed out here in Bridja is levodopa in inhalation powder. This is kind of like a little puffer, like an asthma puffer that allows you to get the levodopa right into your lungs. We're not sure yet whether or not this one will come to the Canadian market at this point. But with the apomorphine subcutaneous and sublingual formulations, there is now something that we can do when a person with Parkinson's suffers sudden, unpredictable off episodes or failed ons. And some have even advocated to use these medications preemptively to abort an off episode that a person knows is about to occur. So apomorphine is not apotex generic morphine. It, apo is the Latin word for comes from. And so this is a medication that is a morphine derivative without any opioid properties. So it doesn't have any pain controlling properties to it. What it does actually is it binds to the D2 dopamine receptors and robustly activates the dopamine system. Um, and we've known about this medication for a long time. About 150 years ago, this medication was being used in animal studies. Um, much more frequently, as, as, as uh, early as 1979, people were investigating the use of apomorphine for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, looking at the date actually here, the, the date is actually not very long after James Parkinson had actually given the name for this disease. 
Um, the reason why, love, uh, why apomorphine fell out of favor, however, was due to a couple of problems. One, when it's taken orally, it induces very severe nausea and even violent vomiting. And two, its duration of effect is very short by comparison to levodopa. So when levodopa came out, when it was discovered, uh, it very quickly became the, uh, the treatment of choice, the gold standard therapy for Parkinson's disease because of longer duration of effect and less side effects by comparison to oral apomorphine. So it's been reformulated to be taken as a sublingual formulation or a subcutaneous formulation. The reason for that is because both of those routes avoid the gastrointestinal tract. They allow for the medication to enter the bloodstream directly without affecting the gastrointestinal tract. So one of the major pitfalls of apomorphine is bypassed in this manner. When we give apomorphine, um, typically via uh, injection as what's shown up here, um, people can still experience a little bit of nausea. And there are some tricks that we do to try to reduce that. But oftentimes if nausea is going to be experienced, it's going to be experienced within the fifth, first 15 to 40 minutes after the dose is given. People will also sometimes start to yawn after a dose is given or develop a runny nose when the medication starts to kick in. One side effect that can happen with apomorphine, but as many know, can also happen with levodopa, is that people can get low blood pressure. This is why right now we're administering the first doses in clinic and monitoring people when they get the first dose to make sure that their blood pressure doesn't drop too low. Theoretically possible is dyskinesia, but quite frankly, we haven't really used this medication long enough to know whether or not that's a significant side effect or not. So stay tuned on that. Um, elevated mood can be both good and bad. If a person has normal mood and the mood becomes too elevated, then a the person can become manic. But if a person's a little bit depressed and the mood is elevated a little bit, that might actually be help helpful. Um, there's the possibility that this medication can increase hypersexuality or risk for hypersexuality, which is an impulse control disorder. We've known that this can happen with all dopamine agonists, including levodopa, however. Um, and there is some thought that maybe this might help to improve libido a little bit. Um, there's the potential for what we discussed as dopa dysregulation syndrome. This is where people start to crave their dopamine medications. But right now, we're not really certain how much of a problem this might be in the real world. Haven't really seen any cases of this myself. And another side effect that is related to the formulation, the sublingual or the subcutaneous formulation, are hypersensitivity reactions. Um, with respect to Kinmobi, the sublingual form, uh, this could be a hypersensitivity reaction of the lips, the tongue, the mouth, the back of the throat. Um, and with respect to the injectable formulation, Movipo, this could be due, this could cause skin irritations or raised indentations of the skin. Um, lastly, some patients have uh, discussed having sleep attacks or feeling very sleepy after they take a dose of apomorphine. And I've seen this in at least one patient uh, so far. In terms of pros and cons of apomorphine, again, rapid onset of action. When you take it sublingual or you take it subcutaneously, um, the onset of the medication is within 10 to 15 minutes. So it very quickly turns a person on. Um, tolerance does not develop over time. So the dose that is used at day one that effectively turns a person on will be the same dose moving forward. And it will always give you a very robust on effect every time you take it. So very robust and reliable effect. Disadvantages, again, short duration. Um, we've seen with the injectable that the duration is somewhere between 60 to 90 minutes, uh, perhaps a little bit longer with the subcutaneous, or sorry, with the sublingual film, might be as long as two hours. So what that means practically is that it's not meant to replace levodopa, though it could potentially allow for lower daily doses of levodopa to be used. 
It's also contraindicated if a person is on a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is a typical medication that is used to treat depression in Parkinson's. And also if a person has had any uh, sensitivity to sulfites in the past, for instance, any sulfa-containing drugs. So this is what the subcutaneous apomorphine looks like. It's an injector pen, very similar to uh, modern day uh, diabetes insulin-like pens. Um, there's the shaft of the pen with an adjustable turning dial here to turn in your dose. And the medication is contained within these clear vials so that you can see how much is left. At the end is a little needle that is very, very thin and most people don't really feel its prick. And the pen is then covered with this sheath uh, to make sure that the pen, the, that you don't accidentally um, dis, uh, give yourself a dose while the pen might be say sitting in your pocket. In Canada, this is marketed as Movapo and in the US this is marketed as Apokine. It was approved in Canada in 2016 and was launched officially in late 2018. We've really been using it since uh, kind of mid to late uh, 2019 here in BC. Um, it's indicated again for the acute management of off episodes um, and could potentially be used as a rescue medication in hospital. If a person has say undergone surgery and they've missed their dose of levodopa, they could be given an injection of the apomorphine. Um, again, it binds to dopamine receptors. Its onset is within four to six minutes. People will typically yawn or develop a runny nose at seven minutes, and the full effect is experienced in 10 minutes. Duration of action is about 60 minutes. They come in packs of five syringes, and when a, a single syringe is opened, it must be used within the first 48 hours. The total amount is 30 milligrams, and most people will take a dose around three, two to three to four milligrams. So there is potentially about 10 doses in one of these syringes that can be used over the course of two days. The liquid, interestingly, turns things to green. So you wanna be careful not to get the liquid on any of your clothing. Um, when we start a person on Movapo, we bring them first to the clinic to do what's called a titration protocol day. On that day, the person will come into the clinic off of their levodopa. And what we want, want to try and do is figure out what is the optimal dose of apomorphine that turns that person on in a robust way, similar to the way their levodopa pills do, okay? Um, we also want to monitor the first few doses given so that if a person develops really low blood pressure, then we can see that in a, in a controlled environment. That is typically done by our clinic nurse at Fraser Health Movement Disorder Clinic. His name is Ravi. He usually brings a person in and spends about uh, four to six hours with the patient on that day, administering doses, uh, increasingly uh, higher doses. Two to three days before you come in for that day, you will start to take an anti-nausea medication known as Domperidone to make sure that you don't experience too much nausea. Most people get a lot of apomorphine on that day. And so we found that uh, on the dose titration day, people are, are likely to get nausea. There was one person, in fact, who showed up and had not taken the domperidone, and that person did experience uh, quite a lot of nausea that day. Whether the domperidone needs to be continued afterwards, for the most part, we found that people who uh, start the medication don't usually need to take the domperidone in the long term. The day is fairly long, it's about four to six hours, and we progressively go at higher and higher and higher doses over the course of an hour and a half um, at a time to see which is the optimal dose for the person to be taking. Um, again, it comes as a multiple dose pen injector setup. The dose uh, dial is up at the top and the medication is contained within the clear vial. There's a sterile needle that is screwed onto the cap. There's a cap protector, then there's another sheath as well. So when you use the pen, you take off the outer sleeve, you wipe the membrane between the medication and the injection needle down with an alcohol swab to make sure it's sterile. You then screw on the needle and take off the protective cone. 
Then you turn the dosage dial until the appropriate dose is selected. So if your dose is three milligrams, you would turn it to three. Then you sterilize the area of the skin where you're going to inject, and then you bring the needle, puncture the skin, and depress the red dial down. And that depresses the medication subcutaneously. And then you safely dispose of the needle in a sharp spit. Moving on, Kinmobi. This is subcutaneous apomorphine. They come in individually wrapped um, foil packages at different doses, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. The medication itself is contained on a sublingual film that looks very much like um, the kind of breath mint strips that uh, you'll see sold in the supermarket. Again, it was reformulated to be a dissolvable wafer that you place underneath the tongue, allowing for medication to go directly through the oral mucosa into the bloodstream. It's a bilayer, so it doesn't matter which side you put the strip down on your tongue. It was modified uh, to a reduce acidity, which helps to reduce oral hypersensitivity, and was also given a menthol flavor to make it taste nice. Um, it dissolves within three minutes. The onset of, of effect is within 12 to 15 minutes. The duration is about on average 90 minutes. And the typical dose that is given is somewhere around 20 milligrams. Though some people may need lower or higher doses, which is why there's a range of medication. Um, again, they look like these dissolvable strips and they are placed right underneath the base of the tongue, as far back in, uh, onto the base of the tongue as possible. Um, again, with the titration schedule, when a person comes into clinic to first start the, the medication, they will take Domperidone three days before the titration protocol day. Then they come in and they get their first dose, which is 10 milligrams, and our clinic nurse looks to see whether or not it's effective, and whether or not it has been tolerated well without any low blood pressures. If the answer is yes, then that's the dose that you take. If the answer is no, then the procedure is repeated again in an hour with a higher dose. And our clinic nurse progressively goes through 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, until we find out which dose is the optimal dose for that person. Uh, again, each film comes in a sealed foil pouch, so they can be used individually, which is a bit of an advantage over the injector pens, where the medication, once the pen is open, you have to use all of the medication within the pen within 48 hours. In this case, with the sublingual film, which comes with 30 strips in a box, one strip can be used at a time. So if all you need is one dose per day, this allows you to spread it out over a longer period of time during a typical month. Um, again, with respect to how to use Kinmobi, before you start, you should drink some water to moisten your mouth to make sure there's enough saliva and swallow a few times to make sure that you get all the saliva down. You then open the tin foil wrapper and remove the strip out of the pouch. Again, it's placed under your tongue as far back as possible. And you keep it under the tongue for three minutes to allow it to completely dissolve. After it's dissolved, you may notice that there's a little bit of green dye left on the base of the tongue, which will go away after a few more minutes. It's really important that you don't chew or swallow Kinmobi as that would allow it to go down to the gut and then you'd feel nauseous. And it's important not to talk while the film is dissolving because that can induce more saliva production. So is apomorphine worth the hype? So far at Fraser Health Movement Disorder Clinic, we've had 11 people started on Movapo and we've got three people who are now on Kinmobi. So I would conclude that that's too small of a sample size for us to draw any kind of definite conclusions. We've had some definite successes, as David will talk about in his part of the talk, 
And we've had some people that had side effects. We've had some people that did better on Kinmobi than they did on Movapo. And I've had one person who's done better on Movapo than they had uh, on Kinmobi. So right now it's still a bit of a, a mixed bag in terms of um, how well these medications work at the individual level. I wanna stress that this is not a one size fits all treatment. It's not ideal if individual off periods are longer than 90 minutes. That's too long of a duration for the Movapo or the Kinmobi to replace the things that we do with the levodopa medications. It does not prevent wearing off episodes from occurring or worsening. Although there is some thought that if you know, for instance, that you're always going to wear off around 5 p.m. at night, you're going to, or in the late eve afternoon, you're going to get one of these late afternoon wearing off episodes that you could take either Movapo or Kinmobi in a, um, in a uh, preemptive manner, maybe half an hour before you're always going to wear off at 5 p.m. So there is some thought that it could be used a bit preemptively. Um, for people with advanced Parkinson's disease who need assistance for medication administration, you need to have a highly engaged caregiver present to administer the apomorphine doses in a timely manner. So for instance, if you're a person with Parkinson's in a nursing home and you don't have somebody around all the time who is uh, attuned to your wearing off episodes, this might not be an optimal strategy for you as you might end up getting the medication too late to reduce the wearing off episode anyways. And cost may be prohibitive. So on the topic of cost, right now, Movapo is covered under BC Pharmacare, but as people will know with Pharmacare, you first have to pay up to your deductible before Pharmacare pitches in the rest as the year goes on. And of course, it does require a special authority request form to be sent by one of the movement disorder neurologists. Um, there is the possibility though that private insurance plans may also offer additional coverage. Although so far, quite frankly, I haven't had any experience with this. So I can't confirm or deny that. With respect to Kinmobi, it is not yet covered under BC Pharmacare. Again, some private insurance plans may offer coverage and right now the company Synovian is offering coverage under a physician experience program, which offers a limited time co-payment plan until uh, coverage under BC Pharmacare is approved. A couple of months ago, Dr. Rast and Dr. Weil and myself had a discussion with Pharmacare about covering this medication and how it's different from Movapo, that in some cases people may do better with one or it may be more practical to give one to give the sublingual film, the Kinmobi, by comparison to giving the injectable. As of yet, we have yet to hear a response from Pharmacare on this matter. In terms of future perspectives for apomorphine, something that has been used in Europe actually for quite some time is apomorphine subcutaneous pumps. Very similar to the idea of a duodopa pump, but instead this goes under the dermis into the skin layer rather than directly into the gut as a duodopa pump would. And so there's potentially less chance for serious infection um, and it allows for apomorphine to be delivered in a very continuous way, which kind of gets around the short duration of the effect of the medication. This is something that is possibly gonna to come to the Canadian market in a product being marketed as ApoGo. So this is something to stay tuned for. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening in today. Um, I just wanted to highlight again that our clinic is located uh, mainly here at Jim Patterson Center. This is the main hub where our multidisciplinary, where we see patients with our multidisciplinary team. Dr. Hinnell, Dr. Rids and myself, we also see patients at different locations in Fraser Health. Dr. Rids is up in New Westminster. Dr. Hinnell is in Langley and myself, I'm in South Surrey. And so we try to spread ourselves around because we know that uh, Fraser Health is quite, quite uh, spread out in terms of geographical location.
Oops, let me turn this off now. There we go. So I think it's my turn, am I right? Thank you, Dr. Kanungo. Yes, David, um, we will pass it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's indeed a privilege to be involved with uh, the session this afternoon. And I'm of course speaking on behalf of my wife, Betty, who was diagnosed in 1995. She was a high school teacher and that of course led to an er early termination of her career. I do wanna say the intervening 20 some years have been rich beyond measure for us. And uh, it's an amazing journey. Sometimes that divides between my heart and my head. I don't see it quite the same way, depending on uh, how I'm observing. A highlight for us was the Parkinson's Congress, the World Congress of Montreal in 2013. What an immense event. So any of you who have an opportunity to attend the next one, I would heartily encourage it. Most uh, more recently, Betty's symptoms have become more pronounced and uh, in the last little while, she's become pretty much dependent, wheelchair dependent and uh, uh, needs assistance for uh, much of daily living. So this uh, leads me to the wonderful care that we've been receiving, professional care. We were with Dr. McEwen at UBC for some years. Uh, Betty was his patient. And then because driving to UBC was getting very stressful, he referred us to Dr. Canungo in Surrey, and uh, we are so grateful. Uh, enjoyed, uh, respected Dr. McEwen, but uh, we are very pleased with the professional help we're getting now. Um, today, I uh, particularly want to acknowledge the uh, care that Dr. Canungo has been providing, very thoughtful care for Betty. I appreciate so much that he observes and he listens very carefully to what is happening. And I think the result of this patient uh, doctor interaction is an important part of care for people with Parkinson's. So when we heard him uh, talk about the possibility of an injectable medicine, that certainly caught our attention because Betty was, uh, her dosage occurred seven times a day. And quite frankly, uh, Betty was really developing a pill burden. And so the prospect of uh, administering medications that was not quite as onerous was very attractive. And this is what then uh, led us to a day of titration as uh, Dr. Canungo has just explained. We spent a day with nurse Robbie Ball at the uh, Jim Patterson Center in Surrey. And really here we met another consummate professional. Robbie is just a delight to interact with. He was very thoughtful, patient, very gentle as he uh, gave us, gave Betty a tryout on different dosages and observed the effect. And at the end of the, uh, well, I think we were there maybe five hours, at the end of the time, he determined that uh, four milligram dosages were the optimum for her. And that has led us, uh, that happened last October. And um, initially uh, we thought of it a bit of a, a more of a rescue medicine, but honestly it's becoming more of a, a, uh, a standard or the, the go-to medicine for us. And so uh, I now inject Betty about four times a day, sometimes five, depending on how busy the day is and how she responds. Uh, and as Dr. Canugo has so eloquently explained, it's, it's under the skin and the effect for Betty is within a few minutes. Uh, she is, her tremors are gone and, and she's relaxed and uh, um, managing well. Uh, the only side effects, as Dr. Canugo has also mentioned, there's some drowsiness and a bit of a drippy nose, but really, those are, I think, small, that's a small price to pay for the effectiveness of, of this of mobile pole. Issues, we have a few issues in managing this. So one is ensuring a constant supply of pens and, uh, and swabs. Uh, and again, we have an amazing pharmacist. He's onto it now. He regularly orders the supply in for us. As soon as I pick one up, he'll order the next one. And uh, I think we have a good thing going. And then of course, to uh, be vigilant to avoid infections. We, uh, the swabs of course are very important to uh, limit the, uh, the, the limit, uh, 
eliminate any infections. To this point, since last October, we've been very fortunate. There have been no difficulties of that kind. Uh, it's of course important that in managing uh, the supply that uh, there's a constant supply and then determining exactly where the injection will be uh, so as not to irritate the skin in one place. Uh, and then environmentally, of course, we're careful to dispose of the uh, spent pens and needles and, and all of that. And so today I uh, just want to again express a deep gratitude to Dr. Kunungo for putting us on to this medicine, medication. And um, unless we see that golden moment soon when this, this mystery disease will be uh, understood and, and solved, until then, we'll just be grateful and uh, do the best we can with what we have. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. I um, appreciate that talk and sharing your story. So if we have any questions, please um, do type them in the chat box, um, whether it's for Dr. Kanungo or David. Dr. Kanungo, I see that you addressed uh, one of the questions. Did you want to talk about it so everybody could hear? Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, could a pump, an apomorphine pump potentially um, uh, potentially take the place of, of Levocarb? And the, the truth is, is yes. Um, uh, backing up a little bit, I should mention that apomorphine has been available. I mean, as I said, it, it's, it's been around for 150 years. The Europeans have used apomorphine more extensively than we have in the management of people with Parkinson's. Um, they have a much um, more extensive background in the use of apomorphine, and they've had pumps now for quite a while. So when we go to like European congresses and stuff, we'll see um, uh, um, posters and things like that about um, patients who have had uh, apomorphine pumps um, and who have uh, replaced their oral levodopa dosing, have had less uh, motor fluctuations. Um, so this is uh, certainly something that, you know, we see as a promising therapy. Um, it's, I, I'm not exactly sure where they are in terms of marketing it in Canada um, or in terms of, uh, you know, trying to get approval first through the body known as CADF and then through provincial pharmacares. I'm not sure where that process is. It's been a while since I've seen anybody from the company, uh, mostly because of this pandemic, I think. Uh, we haven't really been meeting uh, in person as we would normally do. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Maybe I'll give it um, another minute or two. Did you have any other comments, Dr. Kanungo? Um, yeah, so I guess um, something that I, I kind of touched on a little bit but um, the, you know, who, the right fit for, for individuals, if a person starts on an apomorphine uh, medication, um, we've seen, my, my initial impression of these medications was that the faster onset Movapo was going to be the one that most patients would desire uh, just because it, it kicks in quicker. Um, but as time has gone on, uh, I've maybe come to realize that the, the, the quick onset may actually contribute to some side effects in people. Um, so it, it may not be a slam dunk that faster is better. Um, and it may not be a slam dunk that, uh, you know, if you don't do well on one formulation that you're not gonna do well on another formulation. Um, so that's part, part of the learning experience that we've, we've kind of learned over the past year is, you know, how do we give these medications? Uh, who's you know, uh, how do the, how well do they work? What's the right scenario to be giving them in? We're still kind of learning a little bit about this. And it looks like there was, there is another comment slash question. So I, I think Duo must refer to Duo Dopa pump there. Um, it's again, not a one size fits all. Um, a Duo Dopa pump, um, can be very good for uh, people who have a robust effect from levodopa, but are experiencing wearing off between doses um, and are able to look after a uh, duodopa pump. 
Um, so for instance, let's take the example of a person who gets very severe wearing off, which results in freezing of their walking. Um, for that person, when they otherwise take their levodopa, they get a robust effect um, and they almost look normal. Um, for that person, the best thing for that person would be to find some way of giving them continuous infusion of, of, of levodopa. And so that's where a duodopa pump uh, is really ideal. So it, it really is patient dependent. And as everyone with Parkinson's knows, um, no two people are exactly the same with this disease. And of course, no, the management for no two people is exactly the same either. It has to be tailored to the individual's experience. Um, so the next question comes from Marlene Fordham. Uh, she lives on Vancouver Island and she wonders if it's available easily. I assume she means uh, whether apomorphine is available easily there. Um, so um, in terms of uh, availability for apomorphine in, on the island, um, as those who live there might know, there is now a movement disorder neurologist there, Dr. Kieran Tuck. Um, I haven't spoken to Dr. Tuck in a while, in probably over six months. So I don't know for sure if he's starting to use apomorphine yet or not. Dr. Tuck did his training in the U.S. And in the U.S., they had access to apomorphine before we did in Canada. So he, he should be quite uh, experienced with it. But I'm not sure if he started to, um, if he started to, oh, Thet, Thetis Island? Oh, that I'm not sure about. Uh, Marlene just mentioned she's on Thetis Island. But in terms of, of those who are not living within the uh, within Vancouver Coastal Health or Fraser Health region, um, I'm not sure how much either Dr. Weil in Interior or Dr. Tuck on the island are starting to use apomorphine. Um, again, it is a little bit resource intensive on the clinic because you have to have a clinic nurse available who can run the person through the apomorphine titration protocol, at least with respect to Kinmobi. Uh, Kinmobi has offered some, um, some titration centers, um, though I'm not sure if those titration centers are necessarily available um, on the island. Um, if a person was interested in, in trying apomorphine, but they were, not, um, they were not a patient either at Vancouver Coastal Health or Fraser Health, and it was not available with their local neurologist, then um, potentially a referral could be sent to one of our clinics, whichever one is closer, and we could see that person for that purpose specifically. Um, so we would be uh, there to add adjunctive care for, for Parkinson's. And um, I mean, I certainly have patients that come from uh, various islands. I have patients that come from the interior. Um, it, it, the logistics of it are often challenging because um, sometimes we do need to see people in person to get a better understanding of how they're moving. Um, sometimes things can be conducted virtually over uh, uh, telehealth, like we're doing today. Um, so um, there, you know, if a person was interested, though. Uh, in apomorphine uh, treatment, uh, then they would just need to refer or get their family doctor or their neurologist to refer to either UBC Movement Disorder Clinic or Fraser Health Movement Disorder Clinic. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, so I think maybe we could wrap this up. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kanungo, for an informative presentation and David for taking the time to share your, yours and Betty's experience with apomorphine. Um, and thank you all for attending and for your questions. Also, before we end, just a friendly reminder that our provincial conference is approaching October 16th. Uh, we have a great lineup of plenaries, so please check out our website under events for more information and to register. So have a great afternoon and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye for now.